Almost invariably, if you say you're off to South Georgia, people assume you're going somewhere near Alabama. Or more likely, they think you're going somewhere where there might be terrorists down near you know, the Caucasus. It's amazing how many people in Britain do not realize that, that we own this island down in the, in the Southern Ocean on the edge of Antarctica. To reach South Georgia, we had to sail across the vast Southern Ocean. Our team comprised legendary climber and expedition leader, Stephen Venables, social entrepreneur and climber, Rodrigo Jordan, ski mountaineer, Nick Putnam, and myself, David McMeeking, a climber from Kent. Who better to sail with than Skip Novak? And what better to sail on than his 75 foot Pelagic Astralis, the yacht that he built himself expressly for Antarctic expedition. In my ocean racing career, uh, well, I did four around the world races. And in those days, I was the navigator on board at the age of 25, and I navigated around the world with a sextant and a timepiece in those days. This was pre-GPS, pre-satellite navigation. In 85, 86, I skippered for Simon Le Bon on a boat called Drum, and that Whitbread race. Every time I went around the world passing these amazing locations, looking up at these mountainous areas, I said, you know, one day I've got to go there. We set off on the five-day crossing of the Southern Ocean in fairly benign conditions. But pretty soon, storm force winds were forecast and the temperatures were set to plummet. Well, the Southern Ocean, if you look at it, you know, from, let's say, a polar view of the Antarctic, I mean, it's a ring going right around Antarctica. So it's, you know, unimpeded wind and sea conditions totally around the globe at that latitude. The seas there seem to be very confused. The waves seem to be coming from every direction and everything's pitching and turning and tossing and going up and down and from side to side. We're also depending on that boat, on the Pelagic Australis. And you need to be very careful about the boat because if something goes wrong with the boat, then you're gonna be in real, real trouble. I think the speedo was reading 68.8 knots and Skip had been residing on his bunk with the waves hurling themselves around and the boat was tossing around all over the place. Skip came into the pilot house, he looked out of the window and his words were simply, fucking hell. I was focused on the forthcoming climbing, but it wasn't just the day and night sailing of the Southern Ocean that we had to endure, but the really dramatic icing up that we experienced on the boat. We came up with a proposal to go down there in winter. We worked on this theory that might have been flawed about, uh, well, if, if October's good, August and September have got to be better. <laughs> Nobody had done that before a real winter mountaineering trip by sailboat. For me, it wasn't the risk on the mountain which was paramount, it was actually getting there and back in that winter period. This is the accumulation of ice. It's a flung sea spray coming over the bow. Never seen anything like this. You could just watch the ice grow on the lifelines and the rigging. It was like, you know, then you go up and knock it off and then you just watch it grow again. And we couldn't have manipulated the sails because very quickly everything was frozen, all the blocks, all the rigging, all the sheets. So we were stuck with that sail plan, which luckily was a very conservative sail plan. If we would have wound up in a head sea condition on the wind for some reason, you could see how it could all go very badly for you. Very quickly, you'd all of a sudden have, you know, blocks of ice high up in the rigging and the whole boat eventually goes over on its side. I've been climbing over 40 years, I think. But I think what I always dreamt about, the, the big thing was to go on expeditions to far-flung places. 
and those expeditions included the new route up the great east face of Everest, which was a, a thrilling episode in 1988. We followed on his steps. It was the first South American ascent of Mount Everest and we chose to climb the Kangchung face. It's amazing how this experience is so important in somebody's life that it, it makes a border between before and after. When you start thinking about the power of the outdoor activities in general, to develop other capacities within people, you might be amazed. The experience of them really revalidating themselves as, as human beings is something that, you know, worth millions, really, in, in terms of, you know, reward. So I've climbed with Stephen Venables on rock and ice, and also down at my local sandstone crag at Bowles. And it's perhaps here where the seed was sowed for our forthcoming adventure to sail down to South Georgia and attempt some first ascents of unclimbed peaks down there. We survived the icing up and finally arrived at the shores of South Georgia. Thirty meters. There was a wonderful, very, very pointy rock pinnacle called Starbuck Peak. That looked very appealing. There was a big summit which we saw from the boat, which no one has ever attempted. And there's a peak called Mount Macklin, named after Shackleton's doctor, also unclimbed. So just this whole array, peaks that no one's ever even set foot on these peaks, let alone reached their summits. The plan was to climb in the Salveson Range but in order to do that, we needed to find a natural harbour in which we could safely anchor. We want to go ashore at Trollholm, right round the other side of the island. That's the ideal plan, plan A, because it's a nice smooth ramp off the beach. But the problem was the, that southwest wind we had on the sail across sort of persisted. And we couldn't get around to the southwest coast because with that sort of wind and that wind speed, the swell would be enormous and you wouldn't be able to land on the beaches. You'd have to have reasonable conditions to get a zodiac ashore safely. So I said, well, I have plan B. Plan B was to land on the north coast at a place called Iris Bay. As we sailed past Iris Bay, you could see the catabatic winds, the, the willy wars as they call them, these, these sort of screaming winds just racing down the mountains into the bay, spin drift just being blasted across the glacier. Thought, my God, even if we can get a boat in there, getting up on that glacier is just going to be hell. So I was, at this stage, starting to feel pretty, pretty gloomy, really. So plan B was, was that out finished. Plan C, I think, is Larson Harbour, which is, we've, I've skied down to before, but skiing up would be a steep hard work. You go into Dragalski Fjord and then you, you take a sharp left into another subsidiary ford round the corner and you're in this extraordinary anchorage right in the heart of the mountains. Once we're in the safety of Larsen Harbour we could finally get on with the expedition. So food bags were packed for 15 days, tents, safety gear, cooking equipment which was split between us. Once we'd packed all our gear and personal equipment into our pogs, they were damn heavy. It was also sobering to realise we had to pull these up what we knew was a steep slope out of Larson Harbour. Quite steep up there. So we started offloading the gear by stages and you know, making a cache at the, at the snout of the glacier. The idea was to cache some gear up and then come back to the boat and it turned out to be a monumental struggle. I think Skip went first heaving these monstrous loads up this slope. It was marginal traction as you were climbing up with your, your skis with the fur skins on and this, this beast behind you that kept swinging around. But it was getting steeper and steeper, more and more marginal. It was getting very depressing. And I kept looking up, I think we all kept looking up at that pass up above. And you could just see all this stuff just swirling around. Once we got up high, it was evident there was a slab avalanche condition brewing as well. You know, it was quite deep snow and it was getting slabby and we had to traverse a big long slope to get up there. I certainly took a pull. 
it was beginning to look as though our plan would turn into a task of taking all this stuff up to the top onto the glacier, uh, leaving it up there, returning to the boat while the weather worsened, and then eventually in a few days' time going back up and bringing it all down again. I think there was a lot of doubt and the whole thing didn't feel right. That was our last chance of getting into the Salveston range. We got back to the boat and I actually lay awake in my bunk that night, feeling very gloomy and anxious and nervous and depressed. And with horrible visions of, of going across that slope and a, and a slab going and someone being injured or even killed in an avalanche. You're willing to take, I think, a certain amount of risks. Almost we've all agreed that what level of risk we wanted to take. I voted for, I was probably one of the first ones to say, I think we should bail and go north and think again. I think we need, to, we need to go out and do something today. What, mm. what, should, what should that be? Take a light load? Well, I, I didn't see any point in taking loads to the call if we're not going <laughs> to continue with it, you know. If, if we're not going to do this, we'd do better off getting the stuff back down and, and switching to the whole plan to doing day trips. And forget about trying to ski through the Salveston Range. Mm. This was a bit of a a no-win situation and that we were banging our heads against a brick wall and that we should cut our losses and bail out and go and do something else. We could get all things out of the rock today. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If we make an effort, we, we can get oh, everything down. Absolutely, sure. Mm -hmm. The objectives that we set would be fantastically exciting mm -hmm. if we could get them done. It depends also the risk and the danger that's mm. associated with taking a particular course of action. I'd be reluctant at this stage to just abandon everything and go just for day trips. Sure, sure. Mm. I was totally gutted that the expedition to the Salveston Range was effectively over. It felt like the six months that I'd spent preparing for this expedition, all my dreams that I'd associated with climbing in the Salveston Range were shattered and we were walking away with achieving nothing. Things really started to look up when we just started to do other things on the island. Here we were on South Georgia. We had a chance to go out and ski mountaineer some other peaks on day trips and get to see the amazing wildlife that exists on the island. We did visit the abandoned whaling stations on South Georgia and it was a stark and somber reminder of the horrendous whaling industry that had taken place there. There was a rather poignant moment when we visited the grave of Sir Ernest Shackleton and I think this was perhaps when the history of the island really started to sink in. I hold that a man should strive to the uttermost for his life's set price. Robert Browning. I think the plan to climb the Tridents emerged as we were sailing north, and it was obvious that they were there. The little Trident was a splendid. You got this perfect view of the three peaks, and you could just see them just there, one, two, three, in this immaculate blue sky. It began to be obvious that we might be able to reach them and get onto land. Uh, and I certainly remember having my own imagination and enthusiasm and ambition all at once fired up. It was all calm, no wind, perfect visibility, until we got round into Possession Bay where we had decided in our wisdom that that's where we should land. And then it was just back to the same old game again. We got into Possession Bay, all hell breaking loose in the bay. We were at the south end of the island, it was terrible weather. Now we've come to the north end of the island, it's also horrendous. And the middle was pretty good to the left. It must be completely crazy. The thing is to find the horrendous weather, that's the secret. 
just getting the gear ashore was, was enough of business. The thought of actually moving anywhere was horrendous. And in the morning it was no better. At one point, Skip did actually sort of whisper across me, hey, do you think we, do you think we should just bail, just get out? <laughs> Forget about this. <laughs> I said, what now? <laughs> we go back to the boat. It was the right decision just to keep pushing on and fight through it. We climbed up to the call. It was a very hard day. It was a very, very hard day. The first thing we did was build a wall. And it's very satisfying sawing up blocks of snow and building the wall. And then carrying on with the business of putting the tents up, which is quite a performance. And you've got to be damn careful that you don't let go of anything. Because on South George, if you let go of something, it, it's gone. I can't resist a bit of building. <laughs> I'm quite happy. I mean, the tents are quite calm. With this huge wall we've built here, we need to change the weather to see where we're going for a start and a bit of a calmer day to actually sort everything out now, now that we're on our way. Day two dawned beautiful. It was a bit windy and then the wind died right away and it was just an immaculate day. All right, now we're just packing up, leaving this amazing walled city. So it's a glorious day. It doesn't get much better than this in South Georgia, so enjoy it. I like these blue gloves. We headed into the interior of the island, set for a camp at the base of the Tridents. Again, the history of the island confronted us as we passed that lower section of the Trident Ridge. This had been crossed by Shackleton back in 1916 when he traversed the island. We're on the, uh, the Murray Glacier, having come up from the Shackleton Gap. We went up the Murray Glacier. Of course, while we were on the Murray, we looked up at the Trident Ridge uh, where Shackleton, Crean and Worsley passed. And it was a very dramatic moment when they got up to that ridge. And the Trident Ridge was a very significant part of that traversal where they had a dramatic incident there. And uh, this is what Shackleton uh, says from south about that. After a glance over the top, I turned to the anxious faces of the two men behind me and said, Come on, boys. Within a minute, they stood beside me on the ice ridge. We could not see the bottom clearly owing to mist and bad light, and the possibility of the slope ending in a sheer fall occurred to us. But the fog that was creeping up behind allowed no time for hesitation. There could be no turning back now, so we unroped and slid in the fashion of youthful days. When we stopped on a snowbank at the foot of the slope, we found that we had descended at least 900 feet in two or three minutes. We looked back and saw the gray fingers of the fog appearing on the ridge, as though reaching after the intruders into untrodden wilds, but we had escaped. The plan was to get up to the coal between two of the Trident peaks and try and climb at least one of them the next day. Got up in the morning and it was business as usual. It was clagged in, thick cloud, couldn't see anything. So I thought, oh well, we'll just stay in bed. So Stephen, what, what have we got for supper tonight? Risotto. Uh-huh. Same as last time. Yeah, you think, well, gee, you know, now what's gonna happen? Are we, are we gonna sit here now and not be able to actually see where we're going or get up anything? We've seen the Trident, but I wasn't really into, we're gonna climb those things. If we do, we do, if we don't, we don't. We're gonna take it day by day. The weather did perk up and the following day, for once we got away really early, we were away at first light. On a good day, optimism soars down there if you wake up and there's no wind and sunny day and you, know, you, you, you can't wait to get going. That's why I rushed ahead of everybody else. 
as the, the mists parted, there were our, our peaks, our three peaks, appearing up on our left, saying, come and climb me. I was astonished by the view. And you could see all the way that Shackleton have done. The history is into you. It was absolutely amazing. To one side, there was the South Trident, and to the other side, there was the Central Trident. The South Trident had an obviously very feasible route up it, and the most obvious one to get in the bag. Whilst discussing this, Rodrigo Jordan, um, leader of men, said, no, 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 we go for the, the bigger one, the central one, the highest one. I don't know, I mean, take a chance on that, the highest one, take a chance on that, or... <laughs> that one we can see most of the route. You want to go for the highest? High one, Rodrigo. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let's go for the highest. Should we try that one then? Okay. Good. I, well, I reckon we go up, yeah, I think it's easy. Cross the Bergschrund, go around the corner. Yeah, yeah. And, and if there's nothing easy around the corner, we just go up that gully. Yeah. So we went for the central Trident Peak. Being selfish by nature, wanting to bag the best climbing, I said, I'm going to lead this. I must admit, there are the moments when you're climbing when it's hell, the moments when it's tedium and it's boring. And there are moments when you think there is nowhere else on earth I want to be right now. And, and that was one of those moments, just perched on this, this little sort of knife edge ridge with a very impressive drop down the other side. The rest of the team coming up, perfect weather, and uh, after all those disappointments. It's an unclimbed peak described by Shackleton. And then you're climbing this peak with this heroes of one. We got onto the final slope, everyone was coming up, and then I thought, well, I've hogged the lead for long enough. I said to David, hey, why don't you lead this bit? It seems like one minute I'm climbing with Venables on a sunny Sunday afternoon down at the Sandstone Crag at Bowles. And here I am leading the final pitch on the highest unclimbed peak of the Trident. When you're leading, there's a different feeling and because it's just you, you're making all the choices. Knowing that you're the first person ever to be traversing on that was a total thrill. How good is that? Unclimbed peak. Unclimbed peak, highest peak of the Trident. Pretty good. David, you were the first to the top. Congratulations. What a view. I have sometimes been on expeditions or on climbs where I have thought, what the hell am I doing here? Why don't I get a proper job? This is such a stupid, miserable, boring, terrifying, way of spending my life. But I have to say, in recent years, I seem to have mellowed a bit. Maybe I'm, it's the people I've gone with, I think that's something to do with it. But I really felt, I'm really enjoying this. What a treat this is. What a summit. <laughs> what a beauty. <laughs> uh, Yahoo! <laughs> Excellent! <laughs> the trident was first spotted and described by Shackleton himself and we climb that.